Okay, here at a Safeway, uh, I just had like a record oil change. 26 minutes it took them. I thought it would take hours. Not because it takes hours to do it, because a lot of places recently are like backed up and like not really having great customer service qualities, but 26 minute oil change. So, now I'm at Safeway. Okay, wanted to go over some characteristics of the player pool here in Baltimore, because way different than Vegas, even different from uh, some other places I've been on the road recently. First thing, inelastic. So I mentioned this in Caesars New Orleans. I said there was only once in two days I raised preflop and the amount was smaller than $20, which I don't know if I ever had back-to-back -back sessions where I had that few raises preflop to amounts smaller than $20. It was like 20 minimum and I was always getting action. People, so when you're elastic, it's like, oh, I'll, I'll call a raise to 12, probably 15, not 25. Different amounts change the decision making. A lot of people here, a lot of the time, they're calling or they're not. The amount barely matters. If you, they wanna get to the flop. If you race to 10, they're gonna call. If you race to 20, they're gonna call. If you race to 30, they're gonna call, that's it. They're calling, and like the amount is just a formality. Uh, it's also, it's not just good in terms of like getting fat value pre-flop, and it's not just pre-flop, it's on other streets, but it's, it's mostly pre-flop. They airball the flop, then like that's the end of it. They're, they're wanting to get to the flop, those three cards. But it's also good because pretty sure the way like their minds are working, they just want to get to the flop, that's it. They're also not considering re-raises too often could be tricky if guys are folding some hands, calling some hands, re-raising some hands. A lot of people I've seen even with like, even with like tens plus, even with ace king a lot, there's not much of a decision pre-flop. Uh, there's a raise and they very quickly call pre-flop. There's not even like the thought, should I three bet the jacks? Should I three bet king jack suited should i three bet ace queen offsuit some people do but a lot of people aren't so it's just a very simple get fat value pre-flop scenario a lot of the time and not only is it like fun and like a good scenario to be able to raise very high pre if you're not doing it you're leaving a lot of money out there so probably you're like going to play here for the first time whatever amount you think is going to be like a standard pre-flop raise amount that day Go higher, go higher and see from there. You'll probably make it 20 and go like five ways to the flop. You could go bigger than that. Number two is that you need to be aware that high hands are almost always going on. So every day has a high hand. It's not 24 hours every single day. So there are times there's no high hand going, but every day it has a chunk of the day where there's some type of high hand going and it's $300, $400 or $500. Like these are big amounts. You can play all day and not make as much money as if you hit one high hand. So a lot of people are very aware. Uh, the most common like odd thing or like odd play, it's not really a play, that's why I'm putting it in air quotes. It's just a function of the high hand. You'll have people who flop one card away from a high hand. So any set is one card away from quads. Trips, if your kicker stands to play, is one card away from quads. Two pair, if the two pair is big enough. Uh, there, there are times it's aces full of eights minimum. So if you flop aces and eights or a higher two pair than that, you're a two outer away, one of the last two aces in the deck from hitting aces full of eights. So a lot of people will check a flop or just call a bet on the flop check a turn or just call a bet on the turn and then all of a sudden they're like incredibly attached to this pot and playing incredibly aggressively on the river and it looks very weird that would be a very strange play if there were no promotion going on to be like very passive and wanting no money to go in on the flop and turn and then like really attacking the pot on the river with no promo it's often like someone who missed a draw and has no way to win this hand besides bluffing at it and the bluff needs to be large when a high hand's going on if like you're not gonna if you don't play here normally and then you're gonna play here and you see that for the first time it will seem very odd and then the person will show down like flopped top set okay that person cared more about the high hand promotion than winning the pot than getting as much money in the pot as possible 
and just wanted to see all cards to fully realize the high hand equity. And that's why. The person did not want the hand to end on the flop, made sure the hand didn't end on the turn, and then when the river hits, whether the person hit the high hand or not, no more cards left, so now that person could pounce and start putting money in the pot. So that's what that play is like. There's also, so that's strange and like annoying. I don't know, you think you're like winning against like second pair or like a gut shot or something, and then all of a sudden you realize, oh, that person flopped top set, wanted to see the high hand. Um, but pre-flop, pre-flop you could get a lot of money in because people will like, Ace eight offsuit will like call large amounts because of that possibility. People with like seven three suited that can flop a straight flush. I mean, you don't need to flop it, but that could hit a straight flush using both cards. That hand will get to the flop for larger amounts than if there were no promo going on. So just be aware that the high hand, be aware of the high hand hours and how it will affect other people's play. Third, this might be most important. You really need to be betting wet boards. So say in Vegas, the board is like 10, 10, 9, 8, 7. And you have ace 10. It's really difficult to get called by worse because almost everyone in Vegas is going to be terrified that you have the straight, the six, the jack, queen jack. It's really tough to get called by a hand worse than trip 10's ace kicker. It's not impossible, but like you either really need to have some like metagame going on or you need to bet very small. Out here, that, I wouldn't call it a fear, I would call it like awareness, but there's not a lot of fear attached to that awareness. If you had ace 10 on 10, 10, 9, 8, 7, and say there's $100 in the pot, like, I mean, you could bet, like, definitely get away with like $50 bets, betting half the size of the pot and getting called by worse. You can get called by Trip 10's worst kicker. Of course, you're gonna get called by better. Like no one's holding a straight in that scenario, no one's holding a boat, but you can get called by worse. A $50 bet into a pot of 100 in Vegas with Trip 10's ace kicker on that board, that is really ambitious, to put it delicately. Uh, in Vegas, I mean, out of curiosity, someone would probably call like 15, I even think like 20 on a lot of tables is pushing it. Say you had like x-ray vision and you could see your opponent has king 10, trip 10's with a worse kicker. I'm not sure that person is calling a $20 bet into a pot of 100. Out here, like, yeah, definitely half pot is doable. Maybe size it down a little, but yeah, I've had trips when there's been four to a straight. I've bet and got called by worse. I think I had two pair on a board that had like three to a straight, three to a flush, which in Vegas is kind of tough to get called by worse. Uh, seeing other people make bets that I actually thought were bluffs. I actually thought, no, they're trying to get like, go back to that like ace 10 on 10, 10, nine, eight, seven example. I've seen bets where I'm like, okay, that guy's trying to get a six to fold, the bottom end of the straight to fold by repping the high end of the straight. And somehow they get called by like pocket queens, which like, you don't see in a ton of other cities. So not only do you have the ability to get value on really wet boards with like average holdings, if you're not, you're leaving a money out, you're leaving a lot of money out there because you can do it and people are willing to call you down late. Fourth thing, penultimate thing. People wind up with some really, really like random hands and you need to factor that in when you're uh, making decisions. So I remember, Reading uh, Harrington on Hold'em, one of Dan Harrington's uh, poker books. I guess it was volume one. I think there were at least two volumes. This was like, man, I don't know, like 17 years ago or something. But I remember him going through like how to calculate your equity in a pot. And it's like, okay, you're on the turn. There's one card to come. When you're behind, you know, this percent of the time you're behind, but you have this much equity because you could hit a card. This percent of the time you're ahead and you have this much equity to stay ahead, to dodge your opponent's outs. And then he was always throwing in like five or 10% where just like, you're definitely gonna win because your opponent has absolutely nothing and can improve on the river, but is planning a bluff. And he was always throwing in that small percent of the time that your opponent just has absolute junk and those cards are never gonna beat yours. And okay, I understood the concept. Over time, especially playing a lot in Vegas, it's like opponents aren't really showing up with that like absolute nonsense hand that has no chance at winning ever. 
if they do have holdings like that, they often have like a card they're trying to rep. They might be like chasing like the low end of a gut shot, but they're actually pretty aware of the scare cards that could hit the board and they have like a way out. They have a way to win the hand by repping a card that makes some kind of sense. It's not like they're just playing absolute junk and if they miss, that's the end of it. Or if they bluff, it's not gonna make any sense. Out here, you have to factor that in because people wind up with some really weird holdings. There was a bet on a board of 10, 10, 7, 7. There was a bet and a call. And then the river, it was either a 10 or a 7, doesn't matter. But it put a boat on the board. It went check, check, both guys showed down. Neither guy had better than the board and they chopped. So the guy who bet on the turn was trying to bluff. Like his cards don't matter. He was trying to bluff and win the hand that way. The guy who called had queen nine offsuit. So when the dealer's chopping this pot, at showdown, you know, they show down, the dealer's chopping the pot. The guy who bet the turn says, what'd you call me on the river for? Uh, what'd you call me on the turn for? Like, queen nine, like you didn't have anything. You didn't even have a draw. And the guy says, I thought I would river a nine. All right, for one, it's hilarious that rivering a nine would have given the guy a win. But still, um, of all the hands that guy could have had, didn't expect queen nine offsuit to be one of them. I mean, it's not a great idea to chase a, even a straight on that board, but I thought like probably the worst would be like a gut shot to the 10 high straight. Queen nine, he was just trying to hit a pair. And after playing like in Vegas a lot, it's very, very rare to see that. Uh, this was just one example, but hands like that happen a lot. So you're like trying to piece together a hand and put together your opponent's range. You need to allot some space in that range for just like, total madness because it happens a lot all right last thing before i go into safeway number five is that there are a lot of green 25 dollars chips and black 100 dollars chips in play and you can use that to your advantage so for one the high hands get paid out in green and black chips if you win like a 300 dollars high hand they're going to give you two black chips and four green chips some people just put that on the table. Some people put it in their pockets, but if they put it in their pockets, it often comes back out in add-on or rebuy money. Some people just have green and black chips, they buy in with them or they have them from table games. So there's a lot of green and blacks on the table. Some people like hate coloring down to red. Some people, when the dealer asks, don't even know what they're talking about because like you just walk over with green and black chips from table games and you weren't using any reds. So like it's a foreign question to them when the dealer asks. They're just playing with uh, greens and blacks for the most part. I think it's like partly a guess, but like trying to like read their behavior and their like facial expressions. If someone just has a stack of greens and blacks, they seem more likely to call like 50 because they could just throw two green chips out there than a bet of like 30. Because they still have to throw two green chips out there, but they're gonna get changed. It just seems like kind of like a cleaner thing to like bet an amount that they have readily available. And the same thing for the black chips. If someone has like two green chips and two black chips, so $250, even if like the bet for the size of the pot makes sense to be like 75, a lot of people seem more likely to call 100 because they just have that black chip that well they have multiple but they could just throw one of their black chips out and like that's the end of the betting round and they get to the next card they don't need to wait for the dealer to make change and they don't have three greens so they would have to throw out one black get one green or five reds and change so you can size up because of the denominations they're playing it's happened a lot at mgm national harbor and it happens someone here mgm national harbor back in 2018 had more people coming over from the table games and more people playing stacks with absolutely no reds in them. It still happens occasionally here, but it's still the case for people who are just like losing, losing a lot of their reds. Even if someone has like six reds, 30 bucks, and some greens and some blacks, like a $40 bet, they don't have the reds to put in 40. So even if you want to bet 40, maybe betting 75 makes more sense because they have three greens in their stack and they can just throw them out there. So there's a lot of value to be had for like really nothing to do with poker just because of the denominations people are playing. All right, it's gonna wrap it up. 
incredibly fast oil change. I'm here at Safeway. I don't even need anything. I just love supermarkets, so I'm going to go in and walk around. Might get something, might not, but there you go. Five characteristics of the player pool here in the Baltimore area, and I'll see everyone in tomorrow's video. And remember, rice is a spoon food.